So here we have um, Tom, James Benting and Tom Christian from Spark Geo. And in the meantime, you could uh, try to share your screen. Uh, I think James will be sharing his screen. Yeah. You can hear me? Um, yeah. OK. And let's see. Um, well, there they will provide a talk called um, There and Back Again, Lessons Learned in Transitioning from GeoServer to Map Proxy. Again, Map Proxy, that's good to hear. Um, so it will be dual presentation. And James and Tom, they are from Spark Geo, a very innovative uh, company from British Columbia, Canada. And in short, Spark Geo helps customers to make sense of geospatial data and maps providing uh, analytics, insights, and development support. And James here is the vice president of research for Spark Geo. And he is a remote sensing scientist uh, with a background in geography. And Tom here is a full stack developer course, also from uh, Spark Geo, with emphasis on front-end web development and a strong background in geospatial technologies. So in the meantime, I see the, your screen is shared. And um, I'll give the, the floor to you both. And we'll see each other later. OK. Um, excuse me, I, I'm not hearing you, James. Uh, is that better? Yeah, that's much better. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Uh, yeah. So as, as you mentioned, um, I'm James and, uh, and my colleague Tom is here, uh, presenting on, on map proxy and geo server. Uh, we did a project, uh, pre pandemic, uh, about geo server and map proxy. So, uh, we'll get into that today. Uh, before we do, I would just like to, to acknowledge that today in Canada is the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Um, this is where we we kind of um, honor the the families lost during the residential schools here in Canada. Uh, it's kind of fitting for Indigenous workshops stuff that we're doing at FOSWG. So uh, I'd just like to to acknowledge that before we get into it. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, we're doing GeoServer and Map Proxy pre-pandemic we kind of started with GeoServer. um we had a a project where we had to move a lot of customers from one managed service onto another managed service um the older product it was it was it was pretty old and a lot of customers had built workflows around some of the nuances in this product uh so you know we we found out that we had to address some of these nuances with uh, our GeoServer implementation, which didn't exactly suit our needs. So we had to, to do a little of um, massaging <laughs> of GeoServer and other products. Uh, I think the other project was based on Map Server, So it was an OGC thing. Uh, they had kind of not full OGC support, but pretty close. Uh, and then they also had uh, kind of an Esri REST implementation as well. Um, so it was a lot to to move from one managed service to the other. Uh, one of the hurdles we encountered with bringing in GeoServer right off the bat was uh, the nuances that the customers had. So, you know, there was a lack of understanding of, yes, the customer may say they need WMS, but what exactly does that mean? Um, so we had a, a plan to attack GeoServer and, uh, you know, as all, all plans do, they go awry. Um, so what we picked off right at the beginning was, uh, you know, default vanilla geo server, and this satisfied probably 80% of the needs for us. It was, it was great. We could, you know, obviously do a lot of the performance tuning that is required on geo server. The uh, docs on geo server are, are good for that. Uh, there's a lot on performance tuning and it helps quite a bit. Uh, one of the shortcomings we did have, uh, we tried to use the rest API quite a bit. Um, and uh, I'm not a Java developer and I, I was, go down to Java to see what some of those, these REST calls are doing. Uh, and it's never fun for me as a remote sensing tactics to go into Java world. Um, 
individually, these these extensions played really well uh, with GeoServer. Together, they didn't work so well. We had a lot of issues with auth coming through for um, GeoWebCache, um, a lot of stuff with GeoFence and making sure that we can keep the auth for regional um, you know, masking. Um, so we again, we had a plan, uh, and these were the best ways that we could uh, immediately address the the issues in those plans. And GeoServer was, you know, it's tried and true, and uh, it was it was the best solution for us. Um, so GeoServer, we we struggled <laughs> with getting it. Uh, after a certain point, it it becomes kind of uh, difficult to manage. Uh, auth is always a, a challenge. Um, GeoServer comes with with basic auth out of the back out of the bag we use some key modules we we did some header stuff some of these clients as i mentioned were uh, built their applications on an older tech so basic auth uh you know however insecure it is the answer is very uh was was one of the requirements that we had to do um so we had to modify the auth stuff some of these people had uh token parameters in in the query, some had it in the path. Uh, it was kind of a, uh, a fun a fun game for one of our developers to go through and find out exactly how people are authenticating. Um, we got to play with, with projections quite a bit. A lot of these customers were using uh, datums that were uh, kind of frustrating to work with, especially NAD27. Um, in Canada, this was used quite a bit for oil and gas and uh, through my career, I've come across NAD27 a lot, and I've come to really hate NAD27 uh, just because of the, the datum shifts that happen. Um, caching was an issue for us. We, we set up uh, GeoWebCache, and GeoWebCache was working great for us. Uh, we didn't have the customization we needed to do, um, so we looked at something else. And then for uh, for WMS, this was one of the, the biggest hurdles. Some of our clients were using uh, WMS 1.0, some are using 1.1, some are using 1.3. Uh, and the switch between 1.1 and 1.3 has this uh, XY um, swapping positions a lot of the a lot of the time. Uh, and this is you know geo nerds versus math nerds. Uh, but this was a, a big hurdle we had to to overcome is okay, we need to identify the CRS for each one or the EPSG and make sure that we're doing swaps if it's WMS. Um, again, we had to modify the plan according to uh, to real world situations. It was it was doable, it was just frustrating. So uh so we had one geo server instance running up um and you know customers keep coming on and geo server was was doing fine it was starting to handle the load and then it's always a DevOps problem. Uh we had to scale quite a bit and um you know as, as people have talked in other phosphor G's and there's a talk uh, I believe this year on uh scaling phosphor G in kind of a distributed environment uh we we needed to do something like that um and it was it was very frustrating we had kind of separated uh, our 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 development process into auth and uh uh like pardon me we had, we had separated our development process so we had auth we had geo we had caching and we we're trying to keep them kind of separate and uh be able to to spin up um independently in kind of a distributed environment so devops was required to make geo server really sing or at least uh make the other parts um, compensate for, for GeoServer. Oh, I got double map proxy logos. Uh, well, you get it in stereo. Um, so we brought in map proxy. Uh, this was helped to, this was brought in to help with, a lot with the geo web caching issues um, with some authentication going through there. Um, it allowed us a whole ton of flexibility uh, as was previously mentioned, it's written in Python. Uh, so this is uh, this is really good for us. We're predominantly a Python shop, and it makes development a lot easier. We can bring in a whole bunch of different tools. Um, one of the uh, the big things that Tom will get into in a minute is uh, the need to dynamically generate configuration scripts for Map Proxy. Um, and one of the other things that Tom will get in is authentication around Map Proxy uh, and how that kind of module works and how we we address that. Um, so we had again had to modify the plan. This time we brought in newer, kind of well-tested software to to augment older, uh, well-tested, well I shouldn't say that uh, older, well-developed um, software. Um, so I, I I kind of shoehorned 
Tom into letting me uh, have an Ad27 rant here. Uh, so datums are very important for us in the geo world. If we're pushing out data and someone wants a specific projection, specifically, let's say oil and gas, uh, not specifically, let's say an oil and gas example, customer wants a projection uh, in a UTM coordinate, but their base data is made off NAD 27, North American datum from 1927. And as the earth does, things move. So uh, people are still using NAD 27 as a datum to reference real world objects. It's very frustrating as a geo to have this. So uh, that's the end of my rant. Um, and I will I'll transition over to Tom now. All right, thanks, James. Um, so uh, as James mentioned, um, I'm just going to dig into some of the details uh, on, on some of our implementation. Uh, particularly, I'm going to start looking at auth here. And in this context, auth is both authentication and authorization. And this is something that we had to implement with a map proxy work, uh, because uh, obviously GeoServer comes with a, a fairly rich um, set of configuration options around, around auth. Uh, but with map proxy, we, we were kind of a little bit more on our own. Uh, producing our own uh, our, our own our own setup. So broadly speaking, our goals were to ensure that if a, a WMS uh, or the GAP capabilities request comes in, then the response will only include those layers that are authorized for the caller. And um, and so we're not we're not showing anyone data that they cannot access. And then uh, secondly, that if someone issues a GET map request that we're not returning any data for which they're not authorized if they manage to get a layer name um, from outside of the get capabilities document uh, or if they request a mix of um, data for which they are and are not authorized then we we, we filter out the data that they're not supposed to have um, and the nice thing about the the approach that we took with map proxy is that we um, caching is is transparent in, uh, for, from the rest of our system so um, because map proxy manages auth for us and map proxy manages the cache, we don't have to worry about who has access to the cache, which I, I think was one of the issues that we ran up against with geo web cache. Uh, so on my next slide, I've just got a, a basic architecture diagram. Um, so I'll spend a, a minute or two talking through this. So on the top left, we've got our GIS client. So let's think of this as QGIS or ArcGIS desktop or, or any number of uh, proprietary applications. Um, and so this is issuing, for example, a get map request, and that request hits our REST API first. So this is a custom API that we developed using uh, Fast API, an excellent Python API development framework. Uh, and so this is kind of our proxy. This is our layer that we stick in front of map proxy to manage auth for us. Uh, among other things. So within that API, uh, we first have an authentication check. So this is um, you know, clearly just making sure that the caller is who they say they are. Uh, and then we get into the meat of it, which is the, the layer authorization check. So we have an authorization DB, and this is configured with uh, layer names, usernames, uh, and layer grouping. So we can give uh, users access to, to any combination of layers. So we go to the database and we say, tell me every layer that this that this caller is allowed to have access to. That comes back, and then we bundle that up into a, a JWT, a JSON web token. So this is a, an encoded uh, string that um, that we send as an HTTP header when we make our HTTP request over to Map Proxy. So Map Proxy receives the the request that's been forwarded on from our API, and it includes a JWT that tells Map Proxy this caller is allowed to see this list of layers. Uh, we tell it to Map Proxy, and Map Proxy does its thing to determine um, whether or not the, the the request has access to the layers that it's requested. Uh, next, we jump over to S3, which is our image cache, and just see if um, just see if we have actually have the images already cached. And if we don't, then we then we then we push that request up to our upstream WMS or WMTS services, which are kind of either managed by us or managed by the customer that we're doing this work for. Um, and so that the, the whole kind of auth piece here is is really communicated through that JSON web token that we pass to Map Proxy. Um, and that's uh, yeah, and, and that's kind of the, the logic of that is wrapped up in a filter that we register with Map Proxy when it starts up um, that, that we had to write. Uh, down on the bottom right, I've just got a, a, a small example of uh, kind of a contracted example of what that JWT looks like. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, uh, especially if you're already familiar with JSON web tokens. We're just listing the layers. Uh, and then just in the bottom left, um, grayed out there because it's not uh, completely relevant. I just wanted to add the context. We also have um, a, a UI that we built to allow the customer to configure who has access to which layers. Uh, so that's a fairly, fairly simple UI, but it just allows the, uh, the admin to say user A has access to layers one, two, three, user B has access to layer two. 
um, and that obviously feeds into the auth DB. Uh, so next up, I think I'm talking about caching. Um, so yeah, uh, as James mentioned, uh, within Geo, within GeoServer, we were using uh, GeoWebCache to manage our, our cache. Um, but now that we're moving over to MapProxy, we're, we're, we're letting MapProxy do the, the bulk of the work. And uh, the cache itself is stored on AWS S3. In line with MapProxy's recommendations, uh, we configure that with a, a particular directory structure because we are expecting to see a very large number of requests per second in some scenarios. And, and, and that's part of the advice to, to avoid issues with AWS. Um, MapProxy also suggests that whatever CRS we expect most um, image requests to be made in, uh, we cache in a grid suitable for that CRS. Because although MapProxy can do on the fly reprojections, so let's say let's say we have a cache in EPSG 3857 and, and a request comes in in 4326, um, MapProxy will do that reprojection on the fly for us, uh, but we obviously want to minimize the number of times that happens for the overhead and, and for any potential projection issues. Um, as James mentioned as well, we, we had a lot of issues with NAD27 or, or just a lot of fun um, working around its, its peculiarities. So one of the things that we do is we, we store a completely separate cache for each layer in uh, that's based on NAT27. So that if um, if we do have to do that on the fly reprojection uh, to a NAT27 based projection, we can do it off the NAT27 cache. So we're not forcing that data shift. So we it obviously increases the uh, the volume of data that we're caching, but it allows us to sidestep some of those uh, some of those issues during reprojection. So next up, I'm talking about map proxy configuration. Um, so, uh, for anyone not familiar with MapProxy, um, the uh, the system is configured through um, YAML configuration files, um, and it's uh, the way that we approach that configuration is, is a separate YAML file for each of the services that we expose. Um, I don't really have time to get into to, to, to why we, why we separated out to, to those three services um, in the upper right. Um, but essentially, we we have to produce these YAML files, and then when when that YAML configuration file changes, Map Proxy reads it in and reconfigures itself. We also produce a seed configuration file because we have a uh, background seed tasks that, that populate the cache for us uh, for any any image tiles that have not already been requested by user requests. So we have uh, a process that just watches for configuration changes in our in our config database and when it detects that something has changed we have a, a custom python module that reads through the config db generates uh, a whole round of new yaml files uh, and then dumps those into the into the directory that map proxy reads that configuration from uh, so on the next slide i just talk about some of the issues we encountered with that part of it is because we're using s3 for our cache one of the one of the behaviors that we found with map proxy is when uh, map proxy is given a new yaml configuration file uh, it kind of it immediately reconfigures uh, the services, but when you're using S3, what that means is the first get map request that comes in after a reconfiguration, Map Proxy essentially says, "I don't know if I have access to these S3 buckets and directories," and so it goes through a process of firing off HTTP head requests to uh, a large number of uh, of endpoints uh, just to see where it has access to within S3. And, and and I believe just from looking through the code that the intent here is to throw an error if an unauthorized response comes back. But assuming everything is good and you, and you do have access, this is just a very large amount of traffic um, that, that doesn't serve uh, an immediately kind of useful purpose for us. But that first get map request has to wait for all those requests to complete. Now we have a large number of layers, a large number of grids, um, and a large number of zoom levels that we cache to. So this can be thousands and thousands of HTTP head requests. So our, some of our production users can be waiting several minutes for that first map to come back. So that's one of the issues we we, we ran into, and we uh, we're kind of addressing that by um, by by kind of uh, re requiring that we don't really reconfigure during during core business hours. The YAML format that, config that Map Proxy expects is a little bit finicky, um, very particular about the formatting of certain elements uh, and indentations. Um, so that, that that was a little bit of a hurdle for us to get over to understand that. And then the improvements that we'd like to make if we were to revisit this or, or take on another project like this. Um, I'd like to make that S3 uh, check with the large number of HTTP head requests optional. So we don't always have to hit the buckets in S3 um, with a large amount of traffic. But I'd also really like to see Map Proxy with a configuration API rather than relying on these YAML configuration files so that when our, when our 
configuration changes. We don't have to regenerate these YAML files every time uh, and, and have map proxy read them in. It'd be really nice if we could just hit map proxy directly and say, this is the configuration through an API. Um, so I think that's everything I wanted to talk about with map proxy. Yeah, cool. Thanks, Tom. Um, so kind of general lessons learned from this. Uh, GeoServer is still very powerful and still very hard. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, good companies and very good developers who know how to make this thing sing. Um, Map proxy is is very easy to get up and running. Uh, it's really e relatively easy for devs to approach it, um, and it works well in a, a distributed system which we want to play with. Uh, the auth filter and any kind of middleware there is uh, is pretty easy. I don't want to speak for Tom developing it, but it was fairly easy to to develop against. Um, so GeoServer as a backend with map proxy sitting on front, controlling all the access and everything uh, is is a is a win. We actually have some customers who are still using GeoServer uh, in the application. Um, some of the other lessons learned is uh, when you're filtering for blog post and you're doing a time filter go back, GeoServer is old, go back and like way before the land before time and uh, find out you know what what little tricks has developers made um, to, to get around GeoServer's nuances. So look back in the research, there's a lot of stuff there. Um, as, as, as I mentioned at the beginning, we had uh, the old service was doing native Esri REST. Uh, so we had this request come through. Uh, we actually ended up working with Esri uh, to be able to support this. And there was some some finicky stuff. We got to, to chat with uh, some of their developers on their image server team. So that was that was very good. Um, but we were able to get native Esri, Red, Esri support uh, from OGC stuff. Um, that's it. That's the presentation. I'm James Banting uh, and my colleague, Tom Christian, who did kind of all the work on this project uh, is, is here as well. And uh, these are our contacts. Stuff. So thanks for coming to our presentation uh, and we're available for any questions. Okay, thanks, uh, James and Tom. Uh, yeah, very interesting to see how you uh, deal with uh, integrate uh, for instance map proxy and then um, let's see uh we have one question and maybe questions come in while you're answering uh i'll put the question on screen uh it's a short question but uh probably you will know how to answer this one What yeah, is a uh, reverse TMS structure? Sorry, I'm reading it also for the listeners. <laughs> um, I, I, I can speak a little bit about that. It's essentially just, um, I, it's probably best described by the by the map proxy documentation, but it's essentially just a, a particular ordering of, of nested directories. So the way that map proxy will, by default, structure its cache uh, can lead to a high level of nesting directories within directories within directories. And um, although I, I don't recall the, all of the details because this project was a little while back there is um th th there's some behavior in, in aws's s3 uh storage service that um if, if you have a large number of quests requests per second going through that heavily nested directory structure it starts to get upset and i think you start to see some service performance issues um but yeah the, the reverse structure is essentially just changes so rather than i think the the, the reverse structure ultimately starts with the zoom level Oh, no, the zoom level is is the last directory. It goes y, x, z rather than uh, rather than a, in a different ordering, uh, and essentially just it it it, it just changes the, the 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 degree of nesting that you have within your uh, within your within your cache. Yeah. So okay. so rather than storing zoom level last within x like x y z, you have zoom level first to look through the zooms and then. Mm -hmm. come down. Okay. Yeah. Since we have some time, and I happen to be also. Uh map proxy uh, user for years um, but because at some point i i didn't use this uh, file storage anymore and i switched over to geo package storing tiles in geo package and that saved me quite some uh, well some problems uh, especially when moving uh, let's say from a test to a production server basically you have one file <laughs> With the geo package and it's uh, quite efficient so why why should 
Well, but but of course, if you have S3, you have these remote calls, and then probably Geo Package doesn't work that well. Yeah, we so maybe we you had, can comment. Um, yeah, absolutely. We had um, so we had some requirements for for vector products um, that were being drawn as rasters, so we had to put up SLDs, uh, and some of these some of these um, vector products were uh, were image footprints. Uh, so there, you know, there's a lot of them. They're, they cover wide areas. Uh, so GeoPackage worked well for for a bunch of those. Um, we loaded those up into uh, GeoServer as well at the beginning because we we had to throw around vectors and um, uh, everyone loves shape files. So we went with GeoPackage. Uh, it worked out well for us in that regard. But uh, for for the the size of work we need to do. Um, Dumping all the tiles and stuff in Geo Package wouldn't wouldn't have worked for us. Yeah, and I, I have a, a another another thought on that as well. So so my um, my previous experience with with caching large numbers of files is um, the uh, one of the best reasons to avoid well, one of the best reasons to package up large number of files in something like a Geo Package is to avoid some issues you can see on um, with for example a hard drive running out of uh, inodes like hitting its inode limit where you simply have too many files uh, and and the and the hard drive's addressing system can't handle it and so that's where something like geopackage or like the mbt the mb tiles format can be really useful in, in just collating those things into a single file and as, as you mentioned use the um transferring of, of files between environments becomes a lot easier uh, I think for us, mm -hmm. because we're using S3, um, those those kinds of hardware-related um, problems just go out the window. You know, we don't care how many files we're storing on S3, and and, it, and if it means that if storing those files individually means that we avoid the overhead of packaging and unpackaging in and out of the uh, of, of the kind of collated format, then that saves us mm -hmm. a tiny bit of performance every single time. So I think in a different environment, having such a large number of individual files could be a real problem. But just given the uh, how we're storing our data and, and how we're using S3, it, it just stops being our problem. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting that my, my proxy has quite some uh, possibilities in that respect. I know the, 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 the Dutch National uh, Geographic Infrastructure, they even use the CouchDB or use the CouchDB backend also from my proxy. Um, but I see in the meantime, we have, wow, well, um, I think the, the question came also up in the previous. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, mean, uh, there's another question here. Do you know if my proxy can cache Mapbox vector tiles? Uh, so I was curious about the vector aspect of map proxy and going through um, old um, um, emails from uh, from map proxy group. Uh, it, it doesn't explicitly do vector tiles, uh, but my understanding is that the the hookups for it for you to build your own vector implementation are there. Um, I don't think it caches vector tiles so off out of the box. Yeah, it, it came up also in the previous talk, and, and of course this is yeah open source software, and it's also a matter of uh, funding and uh, yeah. I happen to be also in the, the project steering committee for my proxy and uh, yeah, what you rather see is uh, this type of contribution and yeah, it's a long uh, running issue. Um, next question is, uh, can my proxy be run in a container and I guess a Docker container? Yeah, actually. Um, so we were looking at uh, the Netherlands uh, Dutch, um, I think it was an environmental agency, and they PDOC, P D O K, is the yeah, yeah, that's the group. very familiar to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, they they've done a great uh, a great job of packaging up um, Map Proxy into a Docker container uh, with with some like hooks if you're deploying it in Kubernetes or if you're just running it locally. So uh, have a look at P D O K on GitHub. Um, they mm -hmm. have a lot of great resources that that they push out there. Yeah. And um, yeah, also I followed up that from POK and I've even bundled uh, map proxy with map server in a, in a single image because map proxy can call map server as a library. So you don't even need yeah. backend WMS. We actually very, did that very too. efficient. Tom was writing some um, map proxy. So we have one minute. Sorry. <laughs> I'm getting uh, over enthusiastic here. Um, let's see. We have. 
probably time for one last question. Yeah, I have to move, switch between environments here. Uh, oh, it's maybe a longish question. Uh, 